Happy Monday, Brain Scratchers. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. Thank you so much for joining me here today. We've got another case for you. We're going to figure out what's the critical piece that helped break the case. And this one's really interesting because this is a, a case from back in 1981. And the piece that helped break it, that only came in over the past several months. This is one that I think a lot of people um, are going to associate some type of fear with because it is about a bedroom window. And we'll go ahead and just leave it at that. Let's get into it. It's September 4th, 1981, and Judy Butler has decided to walk next door to visit with her sister, 31-year-old Linda Slayton. Linda and Judy had only moved to the subsidized apartments in Lakeland, Florida a couple of weeks before. After Linda's divorce, the Slaytons hit hard times, and Linda and her boys made the choice to move into one of the 80 single-story duplexes that sat in a cul-de-sac beside Lake Bonnet. They lived humbly on food stamps at the government housing site. Because most families had only moved in, into the apartments three weeks before, Linda, being the friendly person she was, had gone door to door introducing herself to residents, offering any help she could provide. She felt this could be a good place for her and her two sons, Jeff and Tim, ages 12 and 15. Linda's mother was due to move into a house just across the street from the duplexes that very weekend. Soon, they would be surrounded by family and friends offering a much needed sense of security. Unfortunately, that sense of security would be shattered forever when Lakeland police received a call at 8.35 a.m. The caller was a maintenance worker at the duplexes and had been contacted by a frantic Judy. She stated that she had walked to her sister's apartment to see if she wanted to meet for coffee, but Linda didn't answer the door. Assuming the family was still asleep, she started walking back to her apartment. As she passed her sister's bedroom window, she noticed that the screen was missing. When she looked through the glass, she could see Linda lying on the bed with what appeared to be a wire coat hanger around her neck. When police arrived, they found out that Linda had indeed been strangled to death with that hanger. Her dress was pulled askew, leaving her exposed. Her underwear and shoes were on the rug below her feet, and her blood was also found on the sheets. Her window was unlocked and the screen had been removed. The inside of her house appeared to have been burglarized, but thankfully Jeff and Tim had both slept throughout the intrusion and assault and didn't run into the assailant themselves. Linda's body was taken to Lakeland General Hospital where an autopsy and sexual assault kit were completed. Because it was 1981, Authorities had very limited resources when it came to DNA identification and instantly hit a dead end when they were unable to identify the offender. Of course, they did figure out the cause of death was determined to be strangulation. And when police questioned her children, they received two pretty similar stories. Jeff said that the day of the murder, he had arrived home hungry from football practice after school, only to find out there wasn't much food in the house. By 5.30 p.m., hunger went out, and he left the apartment and rode his bike to his grandparents' house. They would bring him home around 9.30 p.m., only to find that no one was there. They didn't have to wait long before Linda came home at around 10 p.m. and told them that she was at the next-door apartment with Tim playing cards. Tired from his day, Jeff went to bed but heard his mother and Tim return at about 11 p.m., at midnight, Jeff and Tim saw Linda walking to her bedroom. He and his brother called out, Good night, Mom. We love you. That was the last time either of them would speak to their mother. Tim stated that the day of the murder, he was picked up by his football coach, a man named Joe, and taken to practice at Winston Elementary. At around 8.30 p.m., Joe brought Tim back to the apartment where he ate dinner and went next door with his mother to play cards. Around 11.30 p.m., Tim said he and his mom went home and he saw that his brother Jeff was already in bed. He went to his bedroom where he later told his mother goodnight and fell asleep. In the weeks to come, six detectives would put in 10-hour days trying to figure out who killed Linda. At the crime scene itself, investigators recovered not only semen samples, but fingerprints from the window ledge of the bedroom. The samples were saved as evidence in case a match was found, and the fingerprints were ran against existing databases. Unfortunately, neither brought in any new leads. 
Tips came in from the public and offered several persons of interest, but everyone was cleared. There were no other assaults in the neighborhood or break-ins with similar characteristics to give investigators additional leads to look into. Friends, relatives, and associates were all questioned, but all were dismissed. Linda even was featured on a Crime Stoppers playing card in the hope that it would bring new information in. Even with all the physical evidence investigators collected, the investigation would continue to just move at a grind, but would be worked continuously over the next 38 years. More than 20 detectives would work on this case throughout the years, but one would stick with this case even past his retirement. Bradley Grice dedicated his time to the murder for 16 years before retiring in 2015. In that time, Detective Grice acquired samples from potential suspects, sometimes traveling as far as Oklahoma and Texas, while working to eliminate suspects. Through the years, he would grow so close to Linda's now adult sons, Jeff and Tim, that one of them would name their son after the detective. On November 20th, 2018, Lakeland PD was contacted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in Orlando. They were calling agencies to see if their department was interested in submitting DNA collected from Linda's case to a company called Parabon Nano Labs for further testing. On June 5th, 2019, Parabon released its report. They had found a match for the DNA sample the match came back as a man named Joseph Clinton Mills. Mills, who was currently employed by the Publix Dairy Warehouse, lived in close proximity to the murder scene in 1981 and was actually still living in Lakeland. But there was something far more interesting about Mills. He was a coach for the Lakeland Volunteers football program at the time of the murder. He was the same coach that brought Tim home from practice that day. In order to confirm Parabon's findings, the LPD started monitoring Mills' trash to obtain some of his DNA. Once the trash was collected, the samples were sent in for processing and confirmation. By August 9th, they reported that the DNA profile obtained from Linda's assault was consistent with the DNA profile collected from Mills' trash bags. Investigators also made one other discovery. In January of 1984, Mills had been arrested for an unrelated incident and fingerprinted. The fingerprints taken from Linda's window also were a match to Mills's prints. When investigators first questioned the 58-year-old, he was dismissive, stating that he had never really known Linda or talked to her. He said that on September 1st, 1981, several days before the assault, he drove Tim home from football practice because the boy didn't have a ride. He insisted that he didn't get out of his car or speak to Linda. On September 3rd, one day before the murder, he picked Tim up for football practice, dropping him off at home around 8.30 p.m. He said that this time, Linda walked to his car and thanked him for bringing Tim home. He said after that, he left and hadn't returned to the apartment since that night. But when officers came back on December 4th, 2019, to make an arrest, his story suddenly changed. Mills told police that Linda had extended an open invitation for him to come to her home for a, quote, good time. He decided the next day, the day of the murder, to take her up on her offer. Early in the morning, he entered through her unlocked bedroom window. He insisted that she already had the wire hanger around her neck when he arrived. After that, they had consensual sex, with Linda losing consciousness from the twisting of the wire hanger. When he was done, he left through the same window. He told investigators that Linda did not wake up prior to him leaving. Mills' statement was easily disproved, and the autopsy results showed that Linda suffered injuries inconsistent with consensual sex as well as numerous injuries to her neck that were consistent with a struggle to get that wire off. Joe Mills was charged with first-degree murder, sexual battery, and burglary with assault and battery. Court proceedings are now just getting underway, but prosecutors see no trouble in getting a conviction. They have a lot of strong evidence in hand. Of course, Joe Mills is innocent until proven guilty. Both of Linda's sons are still in shock. They had assumed they would never know the truth or find their mother's murderer. Quote, It's been rough on me my whole life not knowing who it is, Jeff Slayton stated, always being scared to death, always looking over our shoulder. Jeff had also been haunted by the thought that his mother was killed by someone they knew. 
Joseph Mills was actually questioned by police just two days after the murder, but was never arrested. Tim Slayton would say that Mills kept driving him home from football practice even after his mother's murder. I trusted this man, Tim would say. He was the last person in my brain I thought was going to do it. He says the arrest is not closure, but he's finally ready to start moving forward after 38 years. Quote, I know my kids always wonder. They didn't get to know their grandma. It was pretty awesome to tell them, but there was a lot of times I wish my mom was here. She would have been a great grandma to my kids. Case cracked. I'd like to give a big thank you to newspapers.com who provided several original articles from back in 1981. The Tampa Tribune, Fox 13 News, ABC Action News, WFLA.com, TampaBay.co, ABC 7 News, CNN, and of course Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's story. And here we have it, folks. I never get tired of telling these stories. Parabon does it again. I'm so thankful that they have figured out this service. I'm so thankful that it is such a strong result in so many of these cases. And I'm pretty sure that we're going to see a conviction in this one. I mean, when you've got a DNA matchup like that, I don't know. The the odds are are pretty tough. Plus, you've got his uh, version of the story now that they can kind of shoot apart with the autopsy results. So I'm I'm feeling pretty good about a conviction in this case. Uh, It does raise an interesting question, though. If he was fingerprinted back in 1984 for some other issue that had happened, and they had the fingerprints from the window frame, um, why wasn't that match made sooner? And unfortunately, we couldn't find any good information about why that's the case. Uh, I imagine that, you know, fingerprint databases in 1981 compared to today are probably vastly different. I know fingerprint analysis is... It's not quite a science. It's kind of between a science and almost an art form. Um, So it could be that the indicators that were found for one of those fingerprints just didn't line up with the indicators that they noted for the other one. Um, But it just leaves this big question in all of our minds about why couldn't they have made that match sooner. Thankfully, they were able to make a match. And uh, I think fingerprints are probably a little bit easier to get discounted in court than DNA. And I also have to wonder, did he keep did he keep Tim close to him to actually keep tabs on the case? I mean, still giving him rides after the fact, or was this some type of perverse guilt? Um, was he thinking that he was taking care of the boy in some way because he had taken away his mother? I just would like to understand more of kind of the psychology of what's going on in that situation, because I'm sure especially now in hindsight, Tim probably has some pretty weird feelings about this person that he trusted for an extended period of time before and after his mother's death. And uh, I certainly hope that he's getting help. Ultimately, I hope all the best for Tim and Jeff. I hope this family truly finds justice for Linda. I think they're right on the brink of it. And hopefully with that, they will have the path to find some form of peace knowing what actually happened that day. Uh, Thank you to new patrons, Jennifer Ramirez and Carol Gannon. And a big thank you to Dale DeRosa uh, for not only increasing his pledge, but uh, he also left a really interesting uh, note for me. And we talked back and forth a little bit about that. Uh, I haven't really said this on the channel so much uh, recently, but the foundation of this channel is to share my point of view about something and then to hear your thoughts and considerations on that. And that doesn't mean that we're always going to line up, that we're always going to agree. I think it works like a pair of scissors. You need two sharp ends coming together and somewhere in the middle, you get the actual action point that you're looking for. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here on the channel. So I really appreciate people like Dale that maybe don't see uh, 100% or or line up with my opinion 100% on things, but still see what the intent of my work is and support us trying to help these families in need. Of course, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that over at www.lordandarts.com. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I will see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel.